see is that Jacob meets with Esau, then Jacob journeys to Shalem. Uh, in the previous chapter, we saw the high point in the life of Jacob, which was his encounter with God. On that night, a man wrestled with him, and the man, not Jacob, did the wrestling. Jacob wasn't looking for another fight. He had Uncle Laban in back of him and Brother Esau ahead of him, and the last time he saw both of them, they were breathing out threatening. This man, Jacob, is not a position to take on someone else. The man took the, the initiative. He was the aggressor. He was, as we have seen, the, the pre-incarnate Christ. Jacob resisted him until the touch of God crippled him, touched him in the small of his thigh and crippled him. Then recognizing at last who he was, Jacob clung to him until he blessed him. And from this point, we'll begin to see a change happen in Jacob. Something happens when you have a close encounter with Jesus, doesn't it? When people tell me they can have a close encounter with Jesus and it doesn't change them, then I always suspect they didn't really have a close encounter with Jesus. In the first verse of 33rd chapter, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came with him 400 men, and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And Jacob wants to spare his family, so he separates them from the others. And he put the handmaids and the children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And uh, I, I'd love to have a picture of Jacob meeting with his brother Esau because Jacob had deceived him greatly. And uh, Jacob and Esau, remember, was not a spiritual man. And uh, that's the reason that the birthright didn't mean that much to him because the birthright meant you were to be the spiritual leader of that house as well. So he's coming with his hat in his hand because Esau has 400 men with him and Jacob doesn't know if he's going to come as a friend or a foe. Is Esau going to come to kill him? And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Well, they're twins, they're brothers. Let bygones be bygones. Looks as if God has certainly touched Esau's heart because he had sworn vengeance that he would kill Jacob. How many people know there's a lot of family members that lip off like that over a period of time? I always talked about how when my brother lived close, periodically he would come down from the, the house he lived in. He'd stand in front. He'd usually be drunk, and he'd start yelling and screaming at me. He said, I'll kick your butt, and, and he'd stand out there, and he'd rip his T-shirt off. And uh, uh, show me how strong he was. He could rip a T-shirt, I guess. But, and then one, one day I said, you know, I, I've never wanted to fight you, and, uh, and I know that you're hurting for money, and yet you're tearing up your clothes every few days. If, if I was you, I'd, I'd quit tearing your T-shirts and keep working, and things will turn out for you anyway. So he lifted up his eyes. He saw the woman, the children. He saw dead, and, and who are those with thee? And he said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. So Jacob introducing his old family to his brother Esau. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. Well, now, isn't it interesting to see the change that's come about in Jacob? Because uh, he's always been a manipulator, and a little bit of that was sticking in. The way that he divided these groups up, he thought he was going to do war with Esau. That didn't turn out to be that way at all. And uh, uh, Jacob believed for a moment his strategy of approaching his brother had worked, but it wasn't necessary. Listen to Esau. Look what a change had been made in Esau. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep thou that thou hast unto thyself. So uh, here he is, he's, he's come to bring gifts and, and, and really lift up Esau and try to bring some peace in there. But he didn't have to do it because he, God had greatly blessed Esau. Esau's saying, you didn't need to send that to me. I got plenty already. And Jacob said, nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. 
take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. That, that's got to be a fairly humorous scene to have seen that. I mean, you've got to picture it in your mind. Jacob's doing everything he can to keep from Esau and his 400 men attacking him. He divides those families and groups into two deals, and, and uh, uh, even more than two deals, actually, and they kept coming up there and t telling Esau uh, uh, that Jacob uh, brought these presents to his Lord and all that kind of stuff. He's lifting up Esau. And uh, uh, this, uh, here's Jacob. We find Jacob in a new role altogether, and now he's insisting that his brother take a gift. Well, what kind of person had Jacob been before that? Trying to take everything that actually belonged to Esau. Now he's trying to give gifts to Esau. That had to kind of blow Esau's mind. And Esau says, you don't have to give it to me. I got plenty. But Jacob insists and, and that he take it. Believe me, something has happened to Jacob. There's something that happened in, in Peniel, was wrestling with God, that, that started bringing about a change. He reminds me of Zacchaeus in the New Testament. When our Lord called him down and went with him to his house, something happened to Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus at that point there had been a tax collector and, and always stole money and did things he shouldn't have done. And now after having that uh, Jesus in his house, what's he do? He says, I'm going to restore fourfold. And, and so a massive change. When people tell me that they've accepted Christ, but there's been no change, it's hard for me to accept that. Uh, I'm not saying that a person in the flesh will change everything they're doing immediately, but I want to say there's a change of heart in somebody that actually comes to Christ. Amen? And so there's a change that's taken in uh, place inside of Jacob before he, before he had traded a bowl of stew to get the birthright. Now he's willing to give flocks and herds to his brother for nothing. In fact, Jacob insists that he take them. And Esau finally accepts the gift. So in verse 12, it says, Therefore Esau takes the gift, and he said, Let us take our journey, and let us go, and I will be before thee. Esau is saying, Now as you return to the land, let me go before you, show you the way, and be a protection for you. And he said unto him, My Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds with the young are with me, and if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. And Jacob says, I'm moving my family, and we have little ones. Also, we have young among the flocks and herds. We can't go very fast. You, of course, with that army of 400, and probably want to move much faster, so you go ahead. And he says, let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I'll lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord and uh, unto Seir. So Jacob's saying, I can't keep, keep up with you, brother Esau. I'll just have to set my own pace. You go on ahead. And Esau said, let me now leave with, with thee some of the folk that are with me. And he said, what needeth it? Let me find my grace in thy sight, my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way into Seir. Esau lived in southern Canaan, in Seir, the land of Edom at that time. And after their father's death, he moved to Mount Seir, which God sub subsequently gave to Esau for possession. So then Jacob returns to Shalem. The only reason I know it's called Shalem is because these words, you ever wonder, I don't even try to, disc to pronounce some of them, but I'll just, if you, you just Google it, how do you pronounce this word and put it in there and they'll, they'll say it for you. But that's actually pronounced Shalem. And uh, Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built a, a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. Now, don't pass quickly, easily here that we do not pay attention to what's happened. A great change has come over this man, Jacob. All of Jacob's clever scheming to present a gift to his brother Esau has just come to nothing. And God had prepared the heart of Laban, Laban not to harm Jacob, and God has prepared the heart of Esau to receive Jacob. Would you say, it's safe to say that Jacob had the favor of God in his life? Yeah. God had chosen him. He had said that the older would serve the younger. And God had decided that Jacob would be the one that had the birthright, have the blessing, be the spiritual leader of that house. 
And the weird thing about it is, is that Jacob didn't have to use all that manipulation to get that done. And one of the lessons I learned from that is that you don't, once you have the will of God in your heart, you don't have to manipulate everything to make sure it happens. It'll happen. When God says something will happen, it'll happen. You don't have to make it happen. And since Esau is now prosperous, since he attached no particular value to his birthright anyway, there's no reason why he should not be reconciled to his twin brother Jacob. Now the sunshine's beginning to fall on Jacob's life. Laban is appeased, and Esau is reconciled. God had arranged all this for him. Had Jacob been left to his own, he'd have tried to manipulate himself out of everything. Before too long, Jacob's going to look back over his life, and when he does, he's going to see the hand of God in his life. Can I break by saying this? How many times have you just sat back and looked at where the hand of God has been in your life? If you don't do that, sometimes you'll lose that sense of gratefulness and thankfulness to God. Periodically, if you go through really tough things, you'll say, where is God? And at that time there, if you'll take a minute and think about all the mighty things that God's already done inside of your life, you'll be at peace. You know, no matter what's going inside of your life, the Bible says that I can give it to God, and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard my heart and mind through Christ Jesus our Lord. And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which was in the land of Canaan, when he came from Pant, uh, Pat and our Alarm, Pat, I can't pronounce it, and pitched his tent before the city, and he brought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent. He bought it, and at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. Jacob sometimes criticized because he stopped here at Succoth, and Shalem did not proceed on to Bethel. Which, what does Bethel mean? The house of God. And actually, we ought not to expect too much of a Jacob. Here, listen. He's been crippled. He's just learning to walk with his spiritual leg. He's had an encounter with God. But can I tell you something? Sometimes even Christians are hard on people that have just come to Christ. They've just come to understanding in their life who God is. And, uh, and then the old-time Christians want to say, well, you shouldn't be acting that way. You shouldn't be doing it. No, he... He's a babe in Christ, and he's acting like a babe in Christ. And so, and it says, and he erected there an altar and called it, uh, uh, El, I know what it means, but it, it actually means, that word El, Elohi, Israel, means God, God the, of Israel. That's what it means. He put up an altar and, he, and called it God, God of Israel. And, uh, that means that there's been some real growth in this manipulator, Jacob, hadn't it? He's come a long way, hadn't he? The man's on his way to Bethel, and he hasn't arrived there yet. First, he journeys to Succoth. Now, we're going to get into the 34th chapter. And there is, this 34th chapter is one of the roughest chapters to read because there's just horrible things that happen in it. And that's why I got in a discussion with somebody the other day, well, at our men's group. And I said, occasionally people will say, man, people are so evil today. People have always been evil. The very first two children, two children that God created, Adam and Eve, they sinned against God in the garden. The enemy was there. They sinned against God. I mean, evil has always been here. And then you read the story about Cain and Abel. And then you read past Cain and Abel, and, and Cain kills Abel. What do you find out? You find this place where God ends up destroying every living creature except the, except the, uh, the family of Noah. Why? Because he saw there was nothing but evil continually in man's heart. Evil's always been around. We're going to see some of that in this story. Jacob made a mistake, I think, by stopping in Shalem. There's going to be scandal uh, because of this and his family. Dinah, the daughter of, of Jacob by Leah, is defiled by Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite. Then Simeon and Levi, Dinah's full brothers, avenged this act by slaying all the inhabitants of the city of Hamor. That was a bit extreme, wasn't it? I used to have a friend that uh, every time he'd get mad, he'd say things like that. 
I tell you what, I'll blow that place up. He loved to say that all the time. I'll blow that place up. He never blew anything up. I thought he was going to have a stroke. Mad at he get sometime, but he never blew anything up. But killing everybody in a city because of the sin of somebody, that don't make any sense, does it? We need to see that God was right in getting uh, Jacob away from Haran, away from that environment. There are two things that God spends a great deal of time in in Genesis. Number one, first of all, he spends a lot of time with heredity. God's very much concerned that a believer marry a believer and that a believer not marry an unbeliever. And he cares about it. It's important to the sake of heredity. It's the reason that... Uh, it's the reason that God did not want the, the children of Israel to be in strange lands with strange gods. Uh, I still go through that same struggle with uh, uh, when I get a couple that will come up to me and they want to get married. And, I, and I, one of the first things I say, I say, I tell you what, it's you to decide whether or not you're compatible, compatible but it's me to decide whether I'm going to marry you. And if you are an unbeliever married an unbeliever, I might do it. If you're a believer married a believer, I might do it. But if you're a believer and unbeliever trying to come together, I will not do it. And I've had them try to talk me into it. And, uh, but I won't move on that because the Bible says but to not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I told a business friend of mine years ago the same thing. He said, I'm get thinking about going to business with somebody. I said, are they a believer? He goes, well, I don't know. Does that matter? It matters. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You know why? It's a basic thing. You might say, well, they're nice people. Might be nice people. But according to the Word of God, they're not led by the same spirit that you are if you're a believer. The second thing of concern that we see in, in what God shows us is the environment of the individual. Not only or the heredity, but, but God deals in Genesis about the environment, especially in the life of Jacob. He's a big family. Not only there, there were 12 sons, there were also daughters. We're given the record of, of only this one daughter because she features in this very sad chapter. Something else for us to note that's important to the understanding of Genesis, and that is there's trouble in families. Have you noticed that? All through Genesis, there's, fa there's family trouble. And unfortunately, I'll have people that say, you know what? I thought if I raised my kids in the church, there wouldn't be any family trouble. I said, I don't know how to tell you this, but trouble can hit everybody. Because in the first place, you're going to do the best you can to raise them. But did you know that when they leave your home, they're going to start making decisions about their own. They can't live on your faith outside that home. They've got to develop their own faith. Amen. And so there was strife and trouble in the family of Abraham. There was strife and trouble in the family of Isaac. Isaac, uh, Esau was Isaac's favorite, and Rebekah's uh, favorite was her son Jacob. That caused a great deal of trouble. Jacob stops here and goes into she uh, Shalem for a while. It's going to cause a great deal of sorrow to him. The 34th chapter is a sad, sordid chapter. Jacob, or Israel, what we should call him, has built an altar, and he's now given a testimony to the living and true God. There's a change in his life. It's a slow growth, a slow development. That ought to be a lesson to us today, too, and that's, don't expect that as a Christian you're going to become a full-grown overnight. We shouldn't have expected of ourselves and don't expect it of other people. It takes a while. It takes a while when you accept Christ. You become a believer. You're converted. It takes a while for you to get a hold of the Word of God and to listening to the Holy Spirit to live the kind of life you're, you're supposed to live. Amen? And, uh, in fact, we've studied lately in our men's group about how the Word of God's pretty clear that really my job isn't to find rules and regulations in the Bible and try to follow them. My job is to really get a hold of Christ and let Him live through me. And there's a big difference. One depends on your ability to follow Jesus, and the other depends on Jesus' ability to, to operate through you. Amen? And so our spiritual growth and our progress are sometimes very slow. We understand, we get a hold of the Word, and the Holy Spirit's our teacher. 
We may learn truth in the Bible, but we'll find that our lives were very much like Simon Peter, stumbling here, failing there, making stupid mistakes. One of the first things you can do when you make a stupid mistake is forgive yourself immediately. Because one of the great keys to understanding good news is that every mistake you've ever made or will ever be made was covered by the cross of Christ. There's nothing you'll ever do that's not already covered by the grace of Christ because of the shed blood of Christ. Nothing. I, when I met with my brother, we were talking about abuse of our past, and it was amazing that we found out about the same time he had went down to Oklahoma and forgiven my father about the same time I did. And it helped him so much. But it was important for us to be able to get to the place we could forgive. But do you know something that sometimes people don't teach on? If Jesus has already forgiven you, you need to do the same thing. Amen? Sometimes people say, well, God's kind of condemning me for the way I've been acting. God will never condemn you for the way you act. He already condem condemned his own son for it. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture that said, if, if your heart can condemn you not, you have confidence towards your God. So what is it that usually condemns you as a believer? It's your heart. It's your heart. Our hearts condemn us. So you need to learn to do this when you make mistakes. You need to say, well, I thank you, Lord, that you've already forgiven me. And I'm going to walk in that forgiveness and forgive myself for it. Jesus, I invite you in to the trouble and the mess inside of my life. And I trust that you'll bring and make those crooked paths straight again. Amen. There are three chapters in the book of Genesis that are not pretty at all. They all concern the children of Leah, the oldest daughter of Laban who was given to Jacob. And I believe this gives us evidence of, of the fact that God does not approve in plurality of marriages. We see it all through the Bible, and sometimes we think God has given his approval on it. God hasn't given it. You know, God intends for one man at one moment to be married. Not multiple people inside of a marriage. It doesn't work. Multiple people in a lot of things don't work. People grab a hold of scriptures and they try, to, they try to take that scripture and hang their hat on it. I had a guy that used to tell me all the time, now listen to people because there's wisdom, wisdom in a multitude of counselors. And I said, there's only wisdom in a multitude of counselors that are listening to God. Because a lot of counselors out there are not listening to God. We already noticed that there's a great deal of strife in all of those families. But there's a sordidness, a shoddiness that seeped into the family of Jacob that was not in the family of Abraham or Isaac. They had a great deal of difficulty and many problems, but nothing like we see in Jacob's family. We find that here this story about how Dinah was defiled by Shechem. Well, it wasn't a good place, and God wants to separate this man from that area. And believe me, after you read this chapter, you'll come to the conclusion that God had a bed had better separate him from it. In the 34, 1, it says, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. In other words, Dinah's out seeing the town. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, and he took her, he lay with her, and he defiled her. Well, let me put this in the language of today. What did he do? He raped her. He raped her. You know, there are... Uh, for, forcibly raping somebody is never acceptable to God. Never. Not if they're a friend. Not if they're a girlfriend. Not if they're your wife. Everything that happens should be in agreement with both people. The time I remember when sin was sin. Now they've taken the S out of sin and called it in. Certain things are in. They're, they're acceptable, but there's still sin in the eyes of God. Amen? Do we all understand that? That God hasn't changed his mind about sin? 
we have come to accept it because it's everywhere and we look at it and say, well, that's really not so bad. But it's still bad. He may have forgiven us. He may have washed us clean. He may not count our sins against us, but it's still sin. Do we want to please God? We need to have faith in him. How do we know that we have faith? Because we care about what he says and what he instructs us. So anyway, and his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. The interesting thing is that the boy Shechem was apparently in love with a girl and really wanted to marry her. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were uh, uh, with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, in, in 5 and 7, it said, Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out of Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel, lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And it sh ought not be done. But the truth about it is, what should have been done is instead of reacting in anger, they should have allowed him to marry her. Do what? I can't hear you. I know that, but the point is, marrying her would have been better than killing everybody in that town. I don't know what it is about certain people that want to go to the absolute extreme with things. When Jacob heard it, he, he waited for his boys to come in, and they had war counsel. And I'm of the opinion Jacob probably should not have made as much of it as he did. When Hamor, the father of Shechem, came out to him, it's obvious he wanted to get the girl for his son's wife. Jacob probably should have yielded to that because that was, shall I say, the best way out at the time. But there are some people that will always turn to violence. And in 8 9, it says, And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her to him, wife, and, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take your daughters unto you. Intermarriage would have been wrong. Dinah should, uh, it seems that Dinah should have been given to Shechem because that would have prevented a worse sin. But that's hindsight. And ye shall, in 10 and 12, and ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be. Before you dwell and, and trade ye therein and get you possessions therein. And Shechem said unto the father and her, to her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I'll give you according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. And all of this reveals that Jacob's going to have to move on. This is no place for him. Mixing with these people in this land. They didn't think the same. Do you understand that? The uncircumcised Philistine or the uncircumcised people here, they, didn't see, they weren't in covenant with God and they don't see things the same way. As you run on to unbelievers in this world, they don't see things the same way. That's why have you ever talked to somebody about the things of God and they just look at you like they're in a stare? Man, nobody comes to the Father but by Jesus and nobody comes unless the Spirit calls. When I'm dealing with somebody and trying to give them the word and they are absolutely not, after a while, what should I do? I should dust the feet, my dust off my feet and move on. I will tell you a story about that because, you know, I'm old enough to have stories about everything. I was at a prison and uh, I was ministering from a, from a uh, little stage they had set up there. And I had seen these guys that were ministering to uh, uh this one guy that was there that was a songwriter, wrote some good songs, but he was in prison, he was a songwriter. And, uh, and so he waited till I got down off stage. He said, hey, uh, uh, man, I wanted to tell you about some songs I wrote. I said, no, I really don't have time. He goes, why don't you have time? I said, because we're in here, we're trying to lead people to Jesus. I don't know when Jesus is going to return. And right now, I want to lead as many people to Christ as I possibly can. I said, didn't people just talk to you? I saw them talking to you. Yeah, I don't care about that Jesus stuff then I got nothing to say to you, man. You made your choice. And when I got about 15 feet away, he said, wait a second, wait a second. Can you still tell me? Oh, yeah, I'll tell you. I got to tell him the Spirit of God moved on him and he accepted Christ. But can I tell you something? 
if he hadn't called me, I'd have shaken the dust off my feet and moved on because somebody else needs Jesus and I'm not going to waste my time talking to somebody who doesn't care about it. Does that make sense? And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamber, his father, deceitfully and said, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. I feel that Jacob should certainly have taken the leadership of his family. First of all, he should have prevented his sons from deceiving Shechem and Hamor. They said unto him, we cannot do this thing to, to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that, that were a reproach unto us. The thing disturbs me about this incident is that a real reproach, the sin of rape, is ignored. The sin of an uncircumcised person uh, being with somebody that's circumcised, they wanted to bring that up. But they didn't spend much time talking about the rape. That was a real sin. But in this we will consent with you, if ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. Then will we give our daughters unto you, and we make your daughters to us, and we'll dwell with you, and, and, and we will become one people. But if you'll not hearken to us to be circumcised, then we'll take our daughter, and we'll be gone. What's wrong with what he's saying? The same thing is happening here as I've seen happen in ch Christian churches today. If you'll come forward and say the prayer, you can be a member of our church, but words don't, isn't what brings you to Christ. And so we have this same thing happening to this very day. That's why you have people that, that just stir up the air with their words and that's, that was always my problem with some of the big uh, crusades that I've been to where they'll have thousands come down. But Billy Graham did it best when there was follow-up. When there's follow-up, that's fine. If not, you got people that just thought if they come down and said a sinner's prayer that they're all right. But it's more than that. I want to turn away from my old life of unbelief and turn to a life of belief. Amen? And then I've been part of crusades where the people wanted you to come and list all the sins you've done. The only sin you're going to hell for is the sin of unbelief, not for anything else. Amen? So what we really need to come from is from a place of unbelief to a place of belief. Does that make sense? If somebody had come to me and said to me while I was yet using an, an alcoholic and said to me, if you'll accept Jesus... You won't drink anymore. My response wouldn't have been, oh, well, then I better do that. No, it was the goodness of God that led me. It's what leads us to repentance. That's the thing, the goodness of God. And you know what? We better get to the place where we're not trying to get people to just nod their head at Jesus, but realize that you need to come from a place of unbelief and desire for God to be in control of your life. Amen. Great many people think if you join your church, nod your head, are able to use the right vocabulary, use all the Christian words we use, that means you're a Christian. If you've trusted in Christ, something happens. Let me say that again. If you really trust in Christ, something happens in your life. Your spirit is made new. There'll be a constant struggle between this new spirit and your old way of life. But if you can come up and just say a prayer and go back and say, well, I accepted Jesus. I said the prayer. That's not it. Does this make sense to anybody? That's why you've got so many people that are members of churches not active. That's why Billy Graham said one of the greatest evangelistic fields is the church. In 18 and 19, it says, And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem's Hamor's son, and the young man deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he was more honorable than all the house of the father. Now, I agree that this boy is doing an honorable thing at this point. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came into the gate of their pit city, communed with the men in their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade therein for the land there. Behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent for us to dwell with us, to be one people. If every male among us be circumcised, 
as they are circumcised, shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they'll dwell with us. In other words, through intermarriage, these men expected eventually to own everything that Jacob had. And unto Hamor and unto Shechem, his son, hearkened all that went out of the gate of the city, and every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. Performing the rite of circumcision on unbelievers was as phony as it could be. Circumcision didn't make you a believer. Circumcision was a sign that you belonged to God and had your heart towards God. Baptism doesn't make you a believer, yet there are denominations that believe that. But that's just a sign that you are. And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon that city boldly and slew all the males. Well, that's pretty trickery. They waited till everybody was circumcised, all the males were circumcised. That's what they meant by sore. And they attacked them while they were in that condition. In their revenge, they go too far. Neither the rape nor the fact that Hamor intended to dispossess Jacob and his sons of great wealth which Jacob had accumulated in Haran can in any way justify the brutal act of killing all the males there. Simeon and Levi, uh, but does it does reveal something else, the impossible situation of dealing with inhabitants of that land. Can I tell you something? You're going to run onto the, some people in your life. You can't change them. You can't negotiate a change in people. Only God can bring change in people. And they slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. In other words, the other sons joined in on it. It reveals the greed in the family of Jacob is not right, and they had learned it in the home of Laban. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and now didn't. Wasn't it a great deception that the people of this city wanted to get circumcised so they could be in relationship with them, have their sons or daughters, and then everything that Jacob owned would be there? But now what, what do we find out with Jacob's son? And they took their sheep and their oxen and their asses, and that was in the city, and that was in the field, and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took them captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being a few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. Man, there's something wrong in the life of Jacob. Jacob rebukes Simeon and Levi for leaving him in a bad name, but he doesn't rebuke them for the sin they've committed. Do you see this? Jacob's more concerned about what his reputation will be after they committed that act rather than being concerned that they killed all those men. We get a wrong perspective of sin sometimes. There are folks in the churches who will not take a stand on certain issues today. Why? Well, the, the little crowd they run with may not accept them anymore. They're with a little clique in the church and they don't dare stand for anything that little clique wouldn't stand for. Have you seen this in churches? Yeah. They, form, they sit back in the church somewhere and they have their own little cliques complaining about what other people do, but they themselves are guilty of the same thing. God have mercy on Christians who shape their lives by those who are around them and are constantly looking for the effect their conduct is going to have on others. They don't look on whether or not this is the right thing to do. Is it the right thing to do? That's the reason our churches are filled with those who compromise. I don't want to be a compromising Christian. I want to be an uncompromising Christian, the one that will stand upon the Word of God, believe the Word. It's a wonderful thing to stand for truth, and when you stand for it, then you don't have to compromise. And poor old Jacob, what's he doing? Taking him a long time to do some growing up, doesn't it? But he hasn't grown enough. Then these boys, of course, attempt to defend themselves. And they said, should, should, should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? What a thing to say. 
they're saying they're still defending themselves. We had a right to exclude them because, man, he, he dealt with our, our sister like she was some kind of prostitute or something. It is so hard sometimes to get people to realize about the consequences of their actions and let them think about whether or not they're really doing what God wants them to do. There's no excuse that can be offered, and I can have no defense for what these guys did back then. Romans 12, 19 through 21 says this, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Man, for a Christian today, Romans 12 is what we live by. Do I ever get angry about things going on? Yes. Now, do I grab a rifle and go to the top of a tower and kill people? No. I am not going to react the way that unbelievers react. Why? Because I'm a believer. Amen? Amen. There are Christians that will still act in a way that they shouldn't act. But man, you and I are not going to do that. We're going to take a stand on the things that are right. And they're going to see Christ in us. Like we taught at the men's class last night, the key isn't to try to find out what God wants and try to perform that in your flesh. The key is to allow Christ to live in and through you, to invite him into every situation in your life. Well, do you receive that from the pastor tonight? Amen. A lot of trouble in families. Like people like to think, well, uh, things, and I've, I've corrected this many times when people say, well, things are so, so bad now. They're just terrible. Man, things are worse than ever. I said, evil has always been here. Amen. All righty. Well, that concludes our class. Somebody end us with prayer, would you? Everybody looking at everybody else? Amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so what's Brindley do while we're in here? Oh, she's over there? She's round, round, get around. Right 